let's talk about. This is my temple right here right now. Hello. Hi. I'm Lou. Jessica. Jessica. Thank you. Hi. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Very cool. You got some water. All right. Wow. Everyone's yeah. here. Yeah, first thing in the morning. <laughs> so I think people are still waking up, but I'm glad you're it's here. It's so... So, uh, uh, first thing in the morning is uh, like 5.30 when I, True, that's when yeah. I landed this morning. Oh, <laughs> so that was first thing. But, uh, uh, oh, let's, let, let me ask everybody, we've got enough people to get to know uh, your name. Debbie. Debbie. Mano. Mano. Yeah. Nice. Kyle. Kyle. Sam. Sam. Nice. Monique. Monique. Monique and Judy. There's Miss Kelly. Allison. Allison. Natalie. Natalie and David. 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 So we're all met. So awesome. This is very, you know, intimate, <laughs> intimate and pleasant. So, and of course, you, they all know you. I don't know. Some of you might not know me. I'm Jessica. I write for Rumorg Magazine. So I'm here to talk to Lou here, ask so. some questions, and throw it over to you. I'm sure you all have burning questions as well. Um, but in case you don't know who this is, <laughs> uh, you are in a variety of movies, most notably probably Walking Dead for those who are TV watchers. Oh, yeah. um, you've been in a ton of Rob Zombie movies. And then a lot of non-horror as well. <laughs> do you think Rob should be at some time, he should do an episode as a direct yeah. Walking Dead? I always yeah. wonder about that. Because he be actually is really into uh, people uh, uh, reaction to situation. I mean, essentially, sure. we love his movies because he puts people in very difficult situations to... And, we get to watch them react. Yeah. So anyway, I'm going to turn it over to you. Oh, uh, all good. Oh, I love that you have questions too. <laughs> co-piloting. I'm co-piloting. Yeah, perfect. And I just don't know if I can't imagine Rob Zombie doing something for like television that like a, a wide vo audience. Yeah, would have I, view and, like, I would agree <laughs> uh, because he's very um, he, he's he's very in control. The people always ask me what's it like to work with Rob, and I always say, mm -hmm. well, he knows what he wants and he wants what he knows, and there's not really much gray in there and um uh he he though is a storyteller and i think he's an excellent storyteller and based on television's development mm -hmm. we're telling really great stories on television maybe more than our film and also in a film every page so let's call it 96 is important every word because you only got that much time and in 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 a television show you don't have to land everything so much so he might appreciate taking his time he's really yeah. busy yeah he might not appreciate not having to be stuck eight months doing one thing <laughs> that's not really his thing true anyways so he's I'm a rock thinking, musician after all yeah he's got two careers going on so yeah, yeah he's maybe. really a great guy he's very very he's very real and very easy to be around and he's like someone you grew up with but it's a day's work, you know. He's there to do a job, and he wants to do whatever he can to make it the best that it can be. And so he always, he's always very focused. There's not, there's not, you know, it's not a lot of grab ass and set. It's like let's let's go. We got a lot to do. Makes sense. I mean, love him or hate him, he makes movies that people talk about. Yeah. And have opinions about, and yeah, I've liked a lot of them. Uh, how exactly did you get involved with him? Because you've done three movies with him now, so like, how did yeah. that begin? Uh, I remember I had been, there. the casting director at the time, who was his casting director, Monica Mickelson, uh, had known me from Texas and had uh, uh, asked me to come in uh, to read for this movie. And I had never really auditioned for a horror movie. I, I mean, I was doing other types of work and uh, I read this script and I was like, oh my God. I mean, it's the very first scene where uh, Tiny's dragging this naked woman through the woods. I mean, if you remember in Devil's Rejects and I was like, I don't know if this is my cup of tea. Um, <laughs> and then I did go in and Rob wasn't there, but put it on tape, and then it went uh, okay. But I remember being there, and Jeremy Davies was there, and Steve Zahn was there, and I was like, wow, these guys are really, they're kind of, you know, that's 
sort of my reach where I'm going for and they're reading for the same role so there must be something to this and then um, and then they called me back to meet with Rob and do an audition and then I went immediately from there I flew out of Los Angeles to Austin and I was hanging out with some uh, country music buddies of mine and they called and said Rob really likes you and this might happen just to let you know you're coming back right I'm like yeah I'm coming back and and I'm like oh shit uh I might have to go work for this guy. So I called a really good friend of mine named Walton Goggins. So for any of you that saw House of a Thousand Corpses, Walton was one of the deputies, which is my favorite scene in the very first movie. It's the execution scene with a spiral uh, camera lifting shot and Otis has him on his knees in execution, uh, Tom, Tom Toll's deputy in that. And Walton's a good Southern boy, and I asked Walton, I'm like, hey man, I don't know about working for Rob Zombie, I, I'm a little nervous, Going, I'm a good Christian boy from the South, and this guy's this devil worshiper. He's like, oh man, come on, do yourself a favor, this is gonna be your best friend, and it's gonna be a great experience. So he, he did offer me the job, and I did it, and those are true words, he's a really dear friend, he's a great guy, and he makes movies that he liked when he was, seen movies gr growing up and that's what he does oh, and nice. um, I love his sensibility for telling a story I like that he and his wife are tight they got oh. each other's back and you can't say one thing bad about Rob to Sherry and not one thing bad about Sherry to Rob and that you don't see that too often that's a good mm -hmm. that's a good tandem yeah and so uh, so that worked and then you know Rob likes to keep his ensemble and Mm -hmm. Why he does that is because he can count on them. He's from music, so that's like a band. It's a good band. Um, and he knows then that I can count on Bill and Sid, God rest his soul. He's mm -hmm. just left us, bless him. And uh, you know, Forsyth, William, and, and Ken Foray. But then, because I can count on them, I can bring in new people. Malcolm McDowell or Tyler Maine to work with Richard Brake, Jeff Phillips, and I don't have to worry about you know my core group because they know what to do. So I can spend time getting to know these new actors. So I think it's really smart. And then he kind of changes the ensemble and mixes and matches. So it's really been a, a blessing for all of us, you know. And and in the beginning with Rob, he was learning like a new it, it was a it, it was a new medium for him so he was learning quite a bit and and now he knows it so um, I don't know if it's it, it's always new and different but your first time is always great right you know so I I think now it's it's as much work as it's ever been um, and plus he's he's not letting go of his music career by any stretch of yeah. the imagination. He's touring, touring with that Manson guy. We're trying and, to. Um, <laughs> yeah. Manson didn't show up to our show. I, uh, <laughs> where was that? In Toronto last oh, summer. I'm yeah. sorry about that. That's a big show, too. I thought it was a joke. Like, we were sitting down, waiting, and they're like, Has yeah. anyone here seen Rob in concert? Yeah. <laughs> Kelly, you haven't? That's, <laughs> but that surprises me. Um, his show is so energetic mm -hmm. and him on stage is crazy energy uh, so if you go to his show then you kind of realize this guy's got a lot more juice uh, than I do I, I better bring it and and so that's what was great about the devil's rejects there was something magical about that movie and I, I think when we watch it we feel it there was something very very special it was lightning in a bottle. It was just the right perfect storm. I couldn't put my finger on what that is, except I can say at the table read, we were all there and it felt like typically at a table read, you're just trying to get through the words. But this one was really, really good and it felt really special. And then when you get to the set, it had just gotten amped up. And I think it was really because of the veteran guys, uh, Bill Mosley, Sid Haig, Ken Foray, William Forsyth, Jeffrey Lewis, uh, really bringing all that experience 
and and raising the bar and most the rest of us felt it and and felt what was needed from us so it was it was really really great also all of the characters were kind of written with these great arcs almost every one of them mm -hmm. you like for some form or fashion you know the guy that sells chickens you know uh, Michael Berryman's character mm -hmm. uh, E.G. Daly you know they're all really rich and uh, like P.J. Souls yeah. you know is so you, you, and you miss all. them when they're gone you know our characters the band Banjo and Sullivan you miss them you root for them and then you keep rooting till you end up rooting for for the three from hell at the end you know by the time Freebird plays you're kind of bummed out they're gone <laughs> but apparently they're not yeah anyone here seen three from hell yeah it's very good right yeah. it's good it's a perfect kind of bookend to what the trilogy is sorry check that out no it's perfect uh, going back to what you were saying about being a good Christian boy, like I was looking at all the movies you've been in, of some of them are mean characters. Mm, like, mm. have you ever gotten a script or a piece and looked at it and be like, man, like I, I can't do that. Like that's I don't want to say yes, those words. Yes, yes, uh, and not because of any faith, but just because I, I, I didn't. I, I have to find some sort of reason for it. There's, um, there's been a couple of scripts where. It, there's just no reason, you know, like uh, I was getting killed and the guy masturbates on me. I'm like, well, you know, come on, you're going to kill me and then do that. I'm not I, I, actually I'm not going to shame myself and shame yeah. my character. Come on in, brother, and shame my character or my career with that. Yeah. What's the point of that? And this movie sucks. And now it sucks even worse because I'm turning it down. You can't even get me. You you really suck. Um, I mean, it's your personal brand too. So it's like, do you want to be remembered there are as things, that guy? I, there was a point in time where I got tired of the Southern racist guy, mm, yeah. you know, and I started started not. Um, I started not accepting those roles because I felt like I, a I had done it so much, and we don't need to do it anymore. You know, we beat that up, but it's still it's still out there as much as it's ever been. Um, uh, I don't like doing things that violate children, so it's fair. <laughs> I think I try to stay away from pedophile stuff. I don't believe I have kidnapped a kid for sure. I mean, and on screen. <laughs> I'll just clarify. <laughs> well, I had to do, you know, some research. So, uh, you know, yeah. there are a few Nothing missing happened. children that, uh, that just, just for the sake of a good film, you know, how yeah. Barry expected that. So, you know, I had to, I had to deliver. Uh, so, yeah, there's things. Sometimes there's just, you know, they're not all good movies. You know, everyone says, what's your favorite movie? But nobody asks you what's your least favorite movie. You ever get asked that? No. What's your least favorite movie? Least favorite movie. No one ever really asked. Of all time, it's hard to quantify too. <laughs> There's definitely been some well, movies that everybody loves. Well, the good thing is like, you forget those, so yeah. in your favorites you keep you keep in your yeah try to keep the positive your headspace, <laughs> which is which is good, you know. And even bad movies, they're not all good, but you go into them with the hope and the intention that they are all going to be good. And invariably, there's something good that comes from each of them. You meet somebody on set that you really dig. You have a great relationship. You make a friend forever. There's, there's something you learn. You learn something about yourself. It's always a good experience one way or another. True. And then um, the movie becomes, it, it, it becomes something else. And people forget that there's so many moving parts to a movie and there's so many other people that are attached to it that have their their hands on it i was doing the lone ranger with johnny depp to drop a name and we were out in the desert and he goes you know this is the last time right now that this scene is you and mine because it's going to go to sound, it's going to go to edit, it's going to go to score, it's going to go to color correction. All these other people are going to take what we're doing right here and right now and tweak it. And when we see it, it will be nothing like how it was. And that's typically how it is. You know, an actor gets so confused watching the movie and going, 
it's not it's not the moment that I was having there on screen even the great ones there's you know, the greatest moment ever and you're like ah uh, I know you like that but it was so much better how it really was you yeah. know it's, it's so anyway it, that uh, that's a digression <laughs> all good is there a time that you can remember on any of the works you've had where you're just like I just had like a really great moment on set yeah like, was, like, behind oh scenes, yeah scenes. I mean hopefully you're you're always looking for those moments and so I, I think that um, so what happens is with television typically you get into this flow this workflow and it's it's not you it's this collaboration uh, and so on The Walking Dead, it's a really great workflow and everyone's pulling on the same side of the rope and there's no divas and it's super cool and you're, it, it, it's good writing and good producing and the camera work is great and the actors are, are pretty good. All those other things make them better and you get into these scenes and you realize that was pretty good and you're, you're, you're a quarterback, you're Tom Bradley. Uh, are you all Canadian? I know one isn't. Uh, <laughs> We play American football, but you have Canadian football. So. Yeah. Uh, you're, you got your Tom Bradley and Andrew Lincoln, and, and he must, it must be right. It must be right. That's not it. Let's do it again. That's not it. Let's do it again. And you get in this great workflow where you get it, and you're like, fuck yeah, we got it. At the end of the day, you're exhausted, but you're like, it's like a great workout. And you're, whew, we did it. High five, and we got to do it again tomorrow. I'm okay with that. I'm okay. This was a lot of work, but it, it was worthwhile it was validated so you start to say I really so when you miss and you can't fix it sometimes it's just that thing you hurt you're like damn couldn't get that right Rob Zombie's really good at making a decision this isn't working the scene isn't working it's poorly written it's 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 blocked poorly the camera's wrong the war anything is wrong you actors are great when he's very good that way but he moves on he on the walking dead we'll spend a large part of the day or we used to when the show was small making sure it was right rob doesn't have that kind of time and he realizes this scene's not working i'm gonna i'm gonna move on so to the point where if somebody messes up their line or something happens in a scene, he'll change the camera angle and lens, bang, okay, move that, that didn't work. There's a reason that thing fucked up right there. Let's let's re regroup and redesign. And so I, I think it's really smart. Mm -hmm. You know, he... he uh, yeah, why spend all this time fighting something? I think, yeah, I think he never so swims upstream. Good. He's always he's always rushing through the rapid. Makes sense. Yeah. I mean, to go on the sports theme, I know before you were an actor, you actually were minor league baseball. Like, I almost played major baseball, league. yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's pretty awesome. and, and you're involved like the Houston Astros, you're a part of that. They're right? uh, in having the their, their day uh, <laughs> right now in, uh, they won last night yeah, in Washington, D.C. So that, that was something that I grew up as a boy uh, doing in the South, and it was my passion, and I, love it today even still I still have the same dream that I had when I was 12 of playing in Yankee Stadium and going out onto the field and I still see myself going through the tunnel and walking out and what I love about that is it's the same dream I had as a boy and if it's the one thing you can kind of hold on to from being your childhood and it's a dream uh, so I think I always talk about having passion you know passion can serve you and make your literally make whatever it is that you are requesting of the world come true so you you have to uh, as from my experience you must uh, you must think it um, and and with that thought you've got to start building some emotion to attach to it whatever that is it which essentially is passion, right? Emotion. You know, you gotta cry, you gotta beg, you gotta, you gotta orgasm, you gotta shout, you gotta be mad, you gotta be happy. Happy is best, I can tell you. Being mad and resentful about a passion is going the other way. That's the negative. So if you can attach this emotion to this dream, um, then you can start doing 
and again, it gets back to uh, it, it, it gets back to, to putting it out there and then, and, then it, and then it comes rolling back to you. And depending on what level of passion you put towards it, it's, it's, it's unstoppable if you're so passionate. And so I always wonder, how is this guy such a great guitar player? Well, he, he has to be. He must. He's put, at it. He's cool. put that forward in motion um, with emotion, with thought. Um, and then the behavior follows that. Uh, I think, oddly, it's it's the dream that's the difficult thing. It's not obtaining the dream; it's the dream. Uh, and what is it that we have to have with dreams? Got to believe in them. What's belief? It's faith. So you got to have faith somehow, and that's the most difficult thing, isn't it? You know, when you got bills, and you can't pay your rent, yeah. and you. You got a cell phone built, cell phone turned off, and and I'm going to be an actor. <laughs> and your parents are going, "What is? What are you? What's wrong with you? No, you can't borrow four hundred dollars." Um, those are things that uh, you get through. I don't know how. <laughs> I mean, I I don't have any answers to that. Yeah, and so how did you go from baseball to acting? Like, I know one of your first ones was Angels in the Outfield. Was that when you got the acting bug, or was that part of the no, process? No, true story is I followed a, I followed a girl into an acting class. I followed a, <laughs> in Houston, Texas, uh, where I was with the Astros. I, I saw a young lady with a nice pair of jeans and uh, chat went into a building to chat her up, and it turned out to be this this theater and I saw what they were doing on stage and I was like wow these are my people you know I'm from New Orleans and we're storytellers in general and I started to see uh, that's that's what I that's where I there's where I belong you know I mean I could play baseball I was okay but I, I could do that well I could not do that <laughs> clearly I went down I was I was you know but I, I realized through baseball it takes training, so I went back up into Brooklyn to study and then started to find my way, again with a passion. And I think that served me. It's really hard. Uh, today, I think it's not fair because there's so much distraction from passion, you know, from you get do you really love Facebook? If you do, you should be making apps. If you really love that stuff, yeah. you know, if you, if you really, you know, those things. So I just, there's a lot of great stuff, but there's also, you can be distracted and be dabble in almost everything, mm -hmm. which is great, but does it, you know, yeah, I sometimes wonder like how much we could accomplish if we didn't have the internet. It's like we could be all great painters, like a Victorian era when people studied things for hours on end. Maybe, <laughs> There's no distractions. Yeah. And then and then we've learned to shortcut a lot of things because of information mm -hmm. and because of analytics and, and uh, 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 sample sizes of things. There's, uh, I think we have a better sense of science and math, which Good. Which is, I, that turns me on, <laughs> which is not something that I'm, I'm very g good at, but I, but I want to be, yeah. you know, and I, I'm, I'm interested in the science of almost anything. <laughs> but I, so, so I go from baseball, which is um, athletics, and athletics, for those of you who are and have been, uh, it, it's, it's uh, rote, it's, it's repetition, it's, Practice, practice, practice put into play. Um, the arts are organic. So in other words, it just happens. Like we, we haven't rehearsed this visit mm -hmm. before we came in, didn't write a speech or come in and prepare it. And, and here's where I say this and thank you for coming and these things. So it's very organic. And when you come out of an athletic thing where I'm gonna work hard and get better into something that's a very delicate perfect storm, uh, um, it gets confusing. 
I'm going to learn my lines and they are going to be perfect. I'm going to learn my lines and they are going to be perfect. And when you say them, they sound about like that. And the director goes, yeah, maybe a little more natural. Mm -hmm. And so you, you, you have to learn those things. And that's, um, that's a beautiful thing to be able to go from repetition to organic, yeah. you know, that. I wished I had been taught to work smart. Don't work hard, work smart. Hard work is cement. You know, hard work is construction and hammer and nails, but smart is know what you need to do and move on. Take a nap. We should all nap more, I think. We should. I agree. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Here. Can keep going. Yep. What's for lunch? Yeah, that's a good it's question. A good question. Yeah. Yes, sir. Um, so I was a big Is fan it yo yo yolk? No, uh, something something M. <laughs> Mano. Mano. Yes. Shoot, I wasn't even close. That's fine. <laughs> uh, I was a big fan of The Walking Dead. And yeah. And the Thank Dead. you. It was fantastic. Uh, your death was very memorable, uh, I thought. And um, I was curious uh, in all of your roles uh, if you had. <laughs> So I've done a tiny bit of acting in my life, mm. and dying for me was always a highlight uh, mm. where I got to do it. Uh, so I was curious if you had a favorite death for any of your roles that really stands out. That one's great because uh, I wanted it to be very shocking as it was. I remember having seen the Subruder tapes of the Kennedy assassination, and I remember how, even to this day, how that headshot in the reality was breath you know takes your breath away oh. and I wanted that sort of effect also so for it to be so instantaneous and final and there's no going back from that there's no bleed out there's no you can't help that person there's there's no recovery and I wanted it to be her problem then and that was just kind of my own little plan and um because we had talked about, well, how are you going to fall? It's a rifle. It's a long shot. It would be, you know, take you off your feet. I was like, I, I, I said, well, I, you know, I really want to just be on her. And she's going to have to deal with this thing that just happened in a moment. It, it, I wanted to make it about what Carol, Melissa McBride, was, was going to react to. So I really appreciated that death in that form. I didn't, we hadn't planned that she was going to use me for a shield, <laughs> human sandbag, but wisely in the moment she, she figured that out, you know, and we didn't talk about what are you going to do with me. I just wanted my blood to be on her hands to recognize, because she was going to go on with survival. And I was always trying to give humanity to that show and hope. Um, death is hard. I try to honor every death in my life you know I try to I, I try to honor all of the deaths that we we've just had one in our family Sid Haig and I try to honor that and I think it is an honor to have someone expire or to know someone that has and so I take my characters that way and and I try to honor their death and um, I don't think death is an easy thing, and I don't think it will be an easy thing. So I don't try to make it easy. I try to make it as difficult as possible. I've done it where I fought it. I've done it where I have found peace with it. Um, it makes me incredibly sad because I recognize the finality of it. it I will typically be very distraught coming up to it in preparation. Well, the great thing, again, I think I love this death because that day I had to work hard to do everything not to telegraph what was coming. So I was very happy and very upbeat on the day on set. It was a good day and, you know, the little tap on her shoulder and everything. And so, because uh, I knew what was coming, but I didn't want to telegraph it. So that was cool. It, but there have been other deaths where in the devil's rejects the sadness of my friend 
leaving and, and not being able to help him and knowing that, knowing that I would be leaving and and fighting and the anger. So that's a scene where there was so much anger between Bill Mosley and Lou Temple because I kept spitting the blood in his face because I was so angry laying there for six hours where they're just pumping this blood through my neck. It was hotter than blue blazes. It was Dallas heat. And we were out in Palmdale, California. I kept spitting all this blood in his wi- you know, his wig, which meant that they had to clean it every time between he was pissed at me and I was like, Fuck you, Bill, you're not you know, you're on top of me, this thing you get to live, yeah. I'm fucking dying here and you're on you know and we really were frustrated and I'm not sure that came across in the scene essentially I think the scene is actually very poetic calling for Roy in death and and but violent as hell you know so um, so the death I, I take it really personal and, and uh, uh, I don't think it's gonna serve me when my time comes I don't have a, a plan uh, but I do, I, and if anyone dies on set, I try to honor that, which on The Walking Dead is quite often. So it all, it always has an effect, and I always try to be affected. You know, uh, there's not one of us that if we lost somebody, we could just get on to the the zombies. You know, the the vehicle of of the of The Walking Dead. I'm glad you're acting. I know. Well, not so much anymore. But, uh, thanks. Yeah. No I want to give put out a coffee table book because I have died quite a few times called All of Me. Why not take All of Me? I mean, Otis cut my face off. Uh, Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Uh, Arlie blows my head off. Um, uh, Michael Myers smashes my head. Um, geez. Halle Berry killed me, you know, you know. I got ambushed in the, you know, Johnny Depp did shut my eyes and put a feather on my chest and buried me. That was pretty, that was pretty dreamy. That's, that's my romance. He's beautiful. I'm not ashamed to say that. And speaking of all these deaths, like, do your family watch these? Like, do your parents have a hard time watching Yeah, you that bothers them. They don't watch anymore. They're just like, yeah, it's bullshit. It's, it's, it's just, yeah, we know how it's going to go. Because uh, they're always like, well, why did you have to die? You know, well, it's in the script. It's part of the story. That's my part of the story. And so, 10 minutes? We could be done in five. What's for lunch? <laughs> yep. I think we're good. What was that? Your question? <laughs> we're going to be done in five, but we want to know what's for lunch. <laughs> oh. Yep. Uh, yeah. I think we got time. It's only 12.30, so we have um, plenty of time. <laughs> Yeah, my family. The worst was I was doing this show in Dallas called Walker, Texas Ranger. Chuck Norris, you may remember it. My grandfather uh, would watch it because it, it was right in his wheelhouse with his friends. And I, I was recurring on it as this kind of ne'er-do-well, drug-dealing little problem in Dallas. And I'd get my ass kicked by Chuck Norris quite often. So much so that then his assistant started kicking my ass. And the secretary did. I mean, everybody got a shot at me. And my granddad would take it really personal because his friends would give him hell grief about me not knowing how to defend myself. And I'm like, it's just part of the story, granddad. I know, but you always fall for the roundhouse kick. Why can't you understand? Here it comes. Oh, he fights just like you, Lou. Yeah, it's... So there was there was those. It's difficult outside of the industry to explain how those things happen because. We, but but we also I come from a generation where there wasn't so much information about it. You know, I mean, I grew up not really understanding that th- there were actors. I didn't know what an actor was, nor did I care. I just knew Steve Austin was the six million dollar man, and that was cool. And I didn't want to know or need to know anything more than that. Now you know there. 
Facebook or their Instagram or you know what they're doing, what they're going to be. We know so much about everybody that they're nobody. You know, so it's almost too much. It's like when Ozzy Osbourne got a show. I'm like, you went from being Prince of Darkness to this like stumbling old man. Like you kind of ruined it. <laughs> like, yeah, you, you show too there. much. You, yeah, you, yeah, you expose yourself, right? Yeah. Does anyone else have any questions? We have about ten minutes left. I'll continue. Anyone have any good ideas about the future? Yeah. <laughs> it's a tech conference now. <laughs> any inventions? Yeah. Uh, well, I'm a big music fan, and so like, okay. I would think that working up to a role, I would have like a certain soundtrack. Do you have a certain song that you use? That's or a, a great album? question. <laughs> that is a, that's a fantastic question, and the answer is yes to all of that. Uh, interesting. I started to build soundtracks for each character. And I started this with the movie Unstoppable, uh, of which I did um, with Denzel Washington and Chris Pine, chasing the runaway train, that train that was unmanned, and we were, we were chasing that. And I was using, I like um, Creedence Clearwater a lot, and uh, Fogarty, and so I use a lot of their music. I just think that the guys that I do, there's a certain, ruralness to them there's a certain rock and roll to them there's a certain movement that is sort of my vibe there's a certain southern rock even though they're from they're smart guys from berkeley um uh so that and then i realized what that was is it's the soundtrack of your character not so much lou and you it should be sort of outside of your person because your character, even though your character is you, but you know, Adam Banjo is a different guy. So maybe I don't listen to the Allman Brothers every day personally, but Adam Banjo does. So that requires me to do that. So I started doing that. And then when I got to the set of The Walking Dead, both Norman Reedus and Andrew Lincoln were both in their headsets hearing the music. And typically it's a, it's, it's just setting a mood. It's eliciting a tone. So what was cool on Unstoppable is Tony Scott, another gentleman who's left us, who I adore, used to bring speakers in and blast music. And what I liked about that is it got the entire crew and everybody in the mood or the sound, it elicited a, a vibe that I was going to present in a moment so that everybody was sort of with that rhythm of commotion. And so everybody sort of had that energy, which I could feed off of. Like a movie, for instance, uh, 31 with Rob Zombie for Psychohead. And I had spoke with Rob, uh, as I do, Who do, what do you think? And he suggested, I, I, I think this guy probably listens to Black Betty from um, uh, the Ram Jam, you know, and so, I found even a, a, a amped up version of that from a band called uh, Spider Bait that did a version of Black Betty and then had on his set the speakers and blowing that out and it just caught everyone off guard. Wow, oh, I totally get what this is now in these two, these two guys. And so, yeah, I, I so do that. And I, I try to make it different for every, every character. Um, I recently was Edward Sharp and uh, the mag magnetic zeros. Magnetic zeros. It's been Citizen Cope on Walking Dead. Uh, I try to make it really diverse as for me as best I can, and uh, and I think it's important because it's it's one of the senses that we have. Uh, It, it, it helps. Yeah, good question. Oh, thank you. Um, it looks like we have to start wrapping up, but we're, like, what are you working on now? What are we going to see you in next? Well, I just finished up the Tarantino movie, which was out Once Upon a Time in Hollywood. I'm barely in this movie. Most of my stuff got cut, but I'm in it more than James Marsden. I don't know why that's important. <laughs> Something he got paid a lot more than I did, I promise you. So, um, I'm doing, I'm going to go start a Western uh, next week in Los Angeles 
called Shooting Star about a young lady that's very handy with a, a Colt 45. First person to, that Colt had given the Colt 45, a little girl. But they thought she was a boy at the time, so it's kind of this tomboy, interesting story. And uh, then a H.P. Lovecraft um, short story being developed into a television series called Innsmouth, which is about the frog people, secret of Innsmouth. So I'm really excited about that, by the way. Um, and then I don't know, sometimes the unknown is a cool place to hang. Um, not knowing because it will always be better than what your plan is you're only you're only so good but the unknown is infinitely great it's always going to do better than what you you can do so let it let it make make it yours man cool and is there anywhere that we can follow you digitally online? Oh yeah, the uh, Twitter, Instagram. Facebook, well, that's why I was asking Twitter. if someone's got a new app or a new uh, social media. Are we all tired of Instagram by now? Or <laughs> we we can go back to Friendster. Um, I'm on Twitter. I like Twitter for some reason. When we signed with The Walking Dead, we, they that was part of the contract you signed. You had to be on Twitter. They made you get a Twitter account. So, and we all got one. It was. They got huge, and, and Twitter was going away. And then um, in the States, this guy got elected that, that, that plans policy with it. Uh, so I do Twitter, Lou Temple, actor, so original. That's how silly I thought it was at the time. <laughs> and now you're regretting now, it. Yeah, I can. Yeah. Yeah. And Instagram's just Lou Temple. I don't really do that too much. I don't really do Facebook. There's a few fan pages, and... I don't check in on those, uh, but there's going to be there's going to be a new one. Be assured, I don't know what it's going to be, but it's going to be great. I'm going to invent it. You should start it. Well, thank you so much. For oh, thank you in all. Starting off the whole conference with Yay. this. Yay! Oh, was this everybody. the first one? <laughs> this is the first. Yeah, first one of the first day. Dude, yes, we my did first it. interview too. So you made it. Congrats! Gentle. You yes, did thank great. You. <laughs> Thanks. You got you got you got a chance. Thank you, you and Tarantino, yes. you, you, <laughs> yes, the two people happen. I've worked with this year, I think you two might might have yeah, a place. Yeah, All right. Is Rue Morgue uh, out of Toronto? It is, yeah. Yeah, wow, yeah. it's it's a good house if you ever. And you have one show, right, in Toronto? There was one. Like we used to be part of Fan Expo, All and right. then we had Dark Carnival, and then yeah, we don't really have our own right now. I think we need to get one going because this is awesome coming out here too. <laughs> is this Canada, Niagara Falls? I mean, yeah, I know it is, but, Canada side. <laughs> but does it count? <laughs> Barely, like, so no, it's there. not really maple syrup here or anything. Not too much. I feel like it's like a little Vegas. Just talk about it. <laughs> yeah. All right, we'll make the best of it. Yes. We'll make the best of it. Yes. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. <laughs> See, come say hello. Most of you have, by the way. I recognize everybody. So thank you. <laughs>